Hey, good morning, Vision Church family and friends. It's your host, Corey B., and welcome back to another Vision Church online experience. And uh, man, it's great to see you guys, albeit uh, electronically. Um, I hope you all had a great week. I have been reflecting all week on our prayer night that we had last Sunday. And man, it was powerful. Um, for those that couldn't be there, we hope to do more of these. Those that were there, I think, can, can attest that it was cool. It was awesome. Um, you know, just to share a little bit of, of what's been driving me all week is uh, it was about 90 degrees out. There wasn't much wind, no breeze. It was pretty hot. And uh, man, as soon as we started to pray, and lift our hands to the Lord, uh, a breeze came over the parking lot. It was as if we closed our eyes to pray, opened them again, and half the parking lot was in shade. And uh, I just didn't, it was moving. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. And I also got to meet a lot of people and see a lot of faces that I haven't seen in a while. And, uh, and it was awesome. So can't wait till we can actually get back in to, uh, into the church and, and uh, worship together in person. But, um, so we have a couple of announcements I want to get into. If you've got a pen and a piece of paper, jot these down. Maybe you want to grab your day planner so you can go ahead and put these uh, on the calendar. Um, a couple we've talked about before and some we haven't. Uh, first one is we need some volunteers. We are being led by God to do some big things. We've got big dreams and we need, I think it was a Drake song. We've got a really big team. At any rate, we've got big dreams. We need a bigger team, right? So go ahead and sign up on our app to volunteer. Um, there's plenty of, of different things, uh, but we need audio video people more than ever, especially uh, with, just, with just what we've got coming. So, um, so the volunteers, sign up, please. First one, you know about June 20th, make sure it's on your calendar, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We have our thank you lunch for first responders made possible by your generosity and our partners over at Montlawn Funeral Home, Omega Elder Law, and our home watch caregivers um, are helping to make this possible with us. So it is a team effort and, uh, and I can't wait for that. So we need people there, smiling faces, love on our first responders, and, uh, and it's going to be a good time. Now, second one is what, what? I have breaking news coming in. Hold on. We are going to go to our live field reporter right now with breaking news. Go ahead. Thank you, Corey. Yes, we are out here live at Vision Baptist Church where uh, we are bringing you the latest and greatest in breaking news. We have just learned from lead pastor Chris Pratt. We are going to be regathering here in person. June 28th. It's June 28th. We'll be regathering in, perfect, in person. And uh, I cannot wait. I can I can just tell you that, you know, the energy out here is incredible. Um, just it's, uh, it's, you can just feel, you can feel it building. And uh, we're very excited for that. Now, a few points that he wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of is that, um, you know, we will be regathering on the 28th, but we will also be doing it cautionary details that are being put into place as well and, uh, and it's also going to be at a new time we're going to be regathering at 10 o'clock that's 10 o'clock sharp uh, you know it, it, we've become accustomed to starting at 10 so we are going to just transition that right back into the in-person experience as well and uh, we're really looking forward to it out here and he's very excited about it and uh, you know what can I say I can't wait to be a part of it again June 28th we're out here at Vision Baptist Church in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and man, this is going to be a great, great time. Uh, you know, this is Corey B. for uh, from BBC Live Action News, and uh, and back to you in the studio, Corey. Wow, you heard it here first, guys. You heard it here. We are going to be regathering June twenty eighth. Make sure it's on your calendar. June twenty eighth at ten a.m. New start time, ten a.m. We become accustomed to starting at 10 and we're going to go ahead and roll forward with that and uh and we're going to worship together please 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 check the app for more details regarding regathering on the 28th uh, there'll be some safety protocol in place and don't forget we start at 10. so big news big news we're going to be regathering on the 28th we have our thank you luncheon on the 20th we got a big month things are awesome i cannot wait and uh, you know what else I can't wait for? I can't wait to worship today. So let's let's shake off those sleepies. Let's get let's get warmed up. Let's get ready to worship. 
Devin and the worship team are ready to rock and roll. So let's go to them now.
worship team is doing and the commitment to excellence that they're putting into it each week. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of time that goes into rehearsals, to setting up, all of it. So thank you to our worship team for always just, just making me feel uplifted and, uh, and doing such an awesome job. Now, normally we have, uh, we have something we can share and highlight, a testimony or something of that nature. But, um, but this week, um, we got something a little different. And uh, I just kind of want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, your generosity and, just, and what it's allowing us to do. And um, I mentioned in the top of the show of, about our, um, our luncheon for first responders and partnering with Mont Lawn Funeral Home, Omega Elder Law, and the Home Watch Caregivers. Your generosity is allowing us to do things on a bigger scale for the community. And it's allowing us to partner, not just with just having one, like just one partner, but we're able to bring in multiple different partners to make things happen. And I, 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 I just wanted to share that your generosity allows us to do things on a bigger scale, which allows us to, to get more people, more businesses, more organizations involved in what we're doing and that's that's really how we grow and spread is by being able to team up and you know now we have Mont Lawn Funeral Home, Omega Elder Law and Home Watch Caregivers. Anybody that knows anything or has anything to do with those organizations also now know about Vision Baptist Church right on Buffalo Road in Raleigh. They know about us. They know what we're doing. So, um, so thank you for that. It's amazing to see each week what we're able to do uh, when we're obedient, when we, when, we, uh, when we answer that obedience challenge to give as God has given to us. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been incredible. So we have much more planned and we just wanna continue to love on our community. I think that's uh, it's one thing that's needed. Uh, we talk about it over and over. And you'll see in the message today, it's a lot about being bold. And what does being bold look like to you? Uh, I know for me, being bold is, uh, is just a trusting that God's will be done and, and, and asking for God's guidance to lead me, even when maybe his guidance isn't, isn't necessarily what I want. Just turning over control and saying, God, your will be done, 
and just kind of just taking it as it comes, you know, not having any control and just turning that over. I think that's a pretty bold thing for me. It's very bold to do because I, uh, you know, I've got some anxiety, a little depression. I've got, uh, you know, just some, some anxiousness around not knowing and, and, and not having control. So, um, for me, that's, that's about as bold as it gets. And, um, and what, what does bold look like for you? I don't know. But as we go into this, uh, this time of giving, maybe meditate on that a little bit. Was, what does bold mean to me? And of course, we have, uh, we have many ways that we can give. You can give directly from our app, just like you do. You can sign up to volunteer on our app. You can get details about regathering on our app. But you can also give on our app. There's a give icon there. It makes it real easy. And you can even choose what funds you'd like to give to so, uh, so you know where that money's being directed. Or you can just give to the general fund. Um, you can text give VBC to the number on the screen, and uh, and you'll get a text back, and then it'll take you to uh, to a link you can give that way. And of course, you can go to our website and get there. Um, and of course, mail it in, mail it in if you'd like to do that. Um, but of course, you won't have to do that for long. We just drop it off uh, on the 28th. So give on the app. Text give VBC to the number on the screen, visit the website, get there, or you can mail it in and uh, we'll take care of it from there and make sure that we're doing God's work and we're, uh, we're multiplying those blessings to touch as many people as we possibly can in the community. We thank you.
together with one breath, one voice, one cry. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, new hope, new life, new wine. We come together with one breath, one voice, one cry. Jesus, our Savior. Hey, church, let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking your word to cut us, cut us to the heart. Lord, move. May your church never be the same. May we not be the same after today. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Hey, thank you for being here. Comment if you haven't already. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, And and also share this, make sure, um, especially if you are a person or you know people who are, are against the church, who don't want to be in church, who want nothing to do with the church, who's been hurt by the church. Um, I believe this message um, is going to resonate loudly. We are in a series called Dear Church. And and the reason that God laid this on my heart, I believe, is because right now in dark days, the church and the light of Christ through the church has to shine bright. I was told that the darker it gets, the brighter the light should shine. And so we're learning about the church, and particularly in the book of Acts. 
Acts of the Apostles. We're going to be studying through it in the, in the previous weeks. Uh, in week one, if you haven't had a chance, just go back and watch that on our YouTube, on our app, social media, wherever it is. But I, I believe God is going to use this series to change the church for good. And in week one, we talked about how we will have mountaintop moments. For many of you, today has been a mountaintop moment. You feel God, you're, you're with God, you're learning, you're growing, you're worshiping, and you would say, this is a highlight of your week. This is a mountaintop moment. But we also learn that we must, as the church, move. We can't stay on the mountain. There's dying and broken people down the mountain. And we've got to go down, and we have to get out of our buildings and out of our comfort zone and reach them. And last week, we learned what church? That the church is a movement of God's people, not a place for God's people. Because what do you think of when you, when you hear the word church? I mean, have you ever said, I need to go to church? I can't wait for church? That doesn't make sense to the early church because the church is a movement of God's people. So this idea, this, this transition that needs to happen, this change in our mind needs to happen because here's reality, you... And I, as followers of Jesus, we are the church. We don't go to church. We go to vision. We go to, maybe you have another um, body that you belong to, but you go to the building. But you are the church. And we're a movement. And if you're not moving, are you really part of the church? If you're not growing, are you a part of the church? And so we're walking through the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, written by Dr. Luke. And we, we studied last week. Acts 1 and Acts 2, and this week we're going to be in Acts 4, and I'm going to give you a little context, but have you ever thought about this? How do you know about Jesus? I mean, this happened over 2,000 years ago. The early church was established, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, over 2,000 years ago, and yet here we are today, sharing the same exact story. Exactly. I mean, do you think there's some things about the story that are wrong? I mean, 2,000 years, how does a story start 2,000 years ago? How does an event happen 2,000 years ago? And here we are today, still being affected, lives still being changed throughout the world. How does that happen? Because, I mean, most of you can't tell me who won the Super Bowl in 1965, unless it's your team, right? Or you're just a diehard you know, information guru. Most of us can't tell, most of you cannot tell me who won the Super Bowl in 1965. But 2,000 years ago, an event that changed your life and my life, we're still talking about it today. How does that happen? I mean, we can screw that up. Did you ever play the game telephone when you were younger? You know, you know when, you, when you have a group of people and you tell the first person, you whisper in their ear and they pass it down and then the message comes out. Do you know what I'm talking about? If not, Check out this video right now. Did you ask Jeremy to pass the popcorn? No. But why? Wait, he's like way over there. Just pass it on. Dude, last time we did a whisper train, everyone got sucked into a pyramid scheme. Please. I'm so hungry. Fine. Matt wants the popcorn. Matt bought the popcorn. Matt bought a newborn. Matt bought a baby Bjorn. Adam has bad breath. Adam has it bad for Beth. Wait, who's Beth? I am. I think I have a chance with Beth. Hmm. Uh, what did Aaron say? I wasn't paying attention. Well, ask him again. What? What did you say? I think I'm gonna ask out Beth. <laughs> Well, I forgot what he said. That's pretty funny, but that's reality, isn't it? That's reality. We forget really quickly or we get it misconstrued. How is it that we know about Jesus from over 2,000 years ago? The reason the church survived the first century is not simply because of what Jesus taught. It survived the first century because something supernatural, something extraordinary happened, the resurrection of Jesus, and, and the early church committed themselves, devoted themselves to sharing it. 
And, and so you can read in Acts 2, the very end there, that they were devoted to fellowshipping together, to the breaking of bread, to praying, and to telling everyone about who Jesus is. It was a totally outward-focused movement. But do you know what happened over time? The church got buildings. The church got organized. It had to get organized, but there began this hierarchy. People, people got in control. People got in power, and things went crazy. And before long, this outwardly focused movement of Christ followers that was all about love and passion and acceptance and joy. Hey, we don't care what color your skin is. We don't care what your social status is or where you're from. We just want you to know that Jesus is the Son of God and He's risen from the dead. That outwardly focused movement quickly began to turn inward. Inward. You know what I've learned? My short time in ministry. Churches make this transition from focusing on outward to turning and focusing on what's going on inside. In fact, in every church, there's a gravitational pull to focus on what's inside, to focus on pleasing people. And, and, we, and we start thinking more of it like a country club, like it's something we belong to and, and nobody else can come in unless they look like us, unless they talk like us, unless we say you can come in. And that's what the church has become. And, and I can prove it to you. We saw a testimony of Angela a few weeks ago. She was looking for churches all over the place, her and her little girl. And you remember the story? She walked into a church and she was asked to sit in a certain place. They made her sit back there, and, and then her daughter, you know, she's, she's three, she's four years old, she, she's going to have moments where she's loud and things like that, and she was asked to leave because it was disruptive to everyone else. Because Why? Because they were focused on themselves. You know what I bet? I bet most of you have stories like this. Some of you grew up and maybe your parents got divorced. And the church didn't know what to do with divorce. They said, you know, they, they, they made you feel like you're an outcast. Mama had to leave or daddy had to leave and then they forced somebody to leave the church and then your family just said, well, we're not going to do that. Maybe you've got a, a story like that. Maybe your story is worse. Hey, listen. For many people that are belong to vision, you know what it's like to be insider focused. I mean, you've seen a church split because of that. Members, members stand up in the middle of a meeting or a middle of a service and just, just ugliness towards each other. And I want my way. And you, you can't have it your way. This is what we need to do. And no, this is about us. And I want this. And this is how we should do it. And tempers flare, and arguments, th and things were said, things were said that never should be said in God's house. And what happened? People left. People leave. Because they're not going to meet my needs, and they're not going to do what I want, and we're going to have the church the way we want it. Maybe you were, maybe you've had a church hurt, and you just said, forget it. I'm done. Like, my lost friends treat me better than, than church friends do. Church is full of hypocrites. Why in the world would I waste my time with that? that? That's many people's story. Many of you have been hurt by church people, hurt by the church, and you listen to the, the church made up in, of acts, and you listen to that first century church, and you see that they sold things and devoted themselves to everyone else and there was unity and it was just a big family and there was love and you're like, that's the church I want to be a part of. Where is it? Where is it? Because the churches now that I see, there's division, there's segregation, there's complaining, there's gossip, they're focused on all the things they don't have or all the things they do have. They're hoity-toity. I mean, that's the churches I see. I don't see a church like Acts. 
And that's what's happened to church is that we've become this inwardly focused, exclusive group. We forgot that we're supposed to be outwardly focused, taking care of everyone in our community. See, churches do this all over. And, and who would want to be a part of that? No one. No one. But when you look at the, when you look at the first church, something happened. Something happened that just spurred them to greatness, that, 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 that just, just made their testimony, that made people want to be a part of them. Let me just be honest with you, Vision family. I want your friends, I want your families, I want our community to want to be a part of this body because of what God does. So we need to look at it. And and I think we're on mission here at Vision. I think most of us are getting it, that we're moving, that we're growing, but there's still some that maybe not might. And let me just say this, one of the ways you know whether or not a church is still on mission. It's still moving. It's still focused on souls. One of the ways you know whether a church is still on track with what God really intended when he launched the church is how a church prays. In fact, today's big idea is this. How a church prays indicates if it is strayed. How a church prays indicates if it is straight. How the leadership prays, how the body prays corporately, individually, behind closed doors, how we pray indicates if we have strayed. So what we're going to do today, we're going to open up to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to read the first prayer that the early church prayed together. Now, this is remarkable. I'm just going to tell you. And before we really look at their prayer, let me talk to you who are Christians. If you're not a Christian right now, here's what you can do. Just, just, you can tune me out if you want. You can put it on mute. Just, I'll kind of do this when we're back into. But Christians, listen up. I want you to think about your prayer life. Think over the last week of what you've prayed for. For most people, I can probably tell you what you prayed for. Because for most Christians, we kind of pray the same stuff. The the average prayer. Now, we've got high moments, we've got low moments, but the average prayer, we pray for ourselves, we pray for our family, and we pray for a few sick people. I mean, overall, generally, that's how most of us pray. Have you ever noticed maybe the stuff we pray for is kind of, and I'm, I'm not being sacrilegious, I'm not putting it lightly, but the, some of the stuff we pray for is just kind of silly. I mean, it, it's not, it doesn't require a supernatural divine intervention for a lot of the things we pray for. I'll give you an example in my own life. Every time we go on a trip, I say, dear God, keep us safe. And I want that. And I'm always going to pray that, right? But if, if I want to be safe, I need to buckle my seatbelt. I need to keep both hands on the wheels. I need to keep eyes on the road and I need to go the speed limit. And be aware of everything at all times. Right? I don't need divine intervention for that. I think it's a good prayer. Like I said, I pray this. I pray things like, bless me. What does that mean? I mean, aren't we blessed already? Bless me. What are we really saying? God, God, be with us today. You ever prayed that? God is everywhere. Look, child of God, he lives inside of you. God is in your workplace, and God is in your situations, and God is in your family, God is in your brokenness, God is in your, God is there. Young people, help me do well on my test, Lord. You don't need that. You need to study. (laughs) You need to study and prepare. Then you'll do well on your test. Right? I mean, people who don't believe in God, they do well in their tests for for preparation. And I'm not, again, not putting this lightly. I continue to pray some of these prayers. But you know what? You know what the, the thing that all of us have in common when we pray things like this is? 
The center of our prayers is us. It's us. I mean, even if we're praying for our family or our friends, it's still about us. In fact, I was talking with somebody and, and I told him, I said, I wonder if all the prayers we prayed this past week, if the only one that would be changed would be us. Maybe a family member. And I'm not, I'm not saying you should quit praying any of that. If I had to say it, if, I, if, I, if you could hear my heart, here's what I'm saying. Self-centered prayers start acting like self-centered Christians. And all of a sudden, this incredible church, it goes from this kind of church that is outwardly focused, that is helping, that is ministering, that people are being radically changed, that people want to be in, be a part of. We just become church people who do church things, who get on each other's nerves, who complain, And we're focused on us. And then when we're frustrated, we go find another building that we can call church. So today I want to challenge us to pray a different kind of prayer. Okay, so I'm going to set up what's going on in Acts chapter 4. I'm going to give you an overview of Acts 3 and a little bit of 4, okay? So I would encourage you to read this on your own this week. Okay, so we've had this start this movement, right? 3,000 people have joined the church, this movement. They got saved. Peter preached that sermon. We talked about that last week. Okay, a few days after that, Peter and John, they go to the temple. The temple is, in, is where God lives. It's in the center of the city. It's where Jewish people go. So they're going to the temple to pray, but there's a weird element here that Jesus came Jesus came, and so they're Christians, they're followers of Jesus, and so do they need to go to the temple? There's this conflict going on, but Peter and John are traveling together to the temple, and they see what the Bible says is a lame person, a beggar. Now, come on, kids, I'm not talking about lame like your parents, or lame like your students, or come on, adults, lame like your boss. That's not what I'm referring to. I mean, this man was crippled. He hadn't been able to walk since he was born. He was lame, and he was begging. And so Peter and John, they go by this man right outside the temple. And he says, hey, can you give me some money? Peter looks and they said, no, we don't have any money. We got something better. Why don't you just go ahead and get up, rise, and walk on out of here? And this guy's healed miraculously, supernaturally. And man, Peter and John and this man, they go into the temple. This guy's running. He's leaping. He's walking. And everybody knew this guy. He was always there. Hey, there's Johnny. Look at Johnny. He's begging. He can't walk. He's always there. Johnny, come on, man. Move on. Get a job, Johnny. Go, go on out of here. We don't need you to mess with our temple. Our church is too nice for this. And now, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that Johnny? Holy cow. What's he doing? He's walking? What happened to him? And so this big crowd comes around him. There's some commotion Peter's like, well, look, look, everyone's here. Let me do what I do. The Holy Spirit, and he preaches a sermon in the middle of the temple. Now, he's not supposed to do that. It's just a regular man. He's preaching there, and he can't stop saying, Jesus, whom you have crucified, is now raised. He's been resurrected. He keeps saying this over and over again. He's been resurrected, resurrected. And Luke tells us in the book of Acts, by the end of of the day, by the end of this message, by the end of his sermon, over 5,000 men become Christians, join this movement called the church. We had 3,000, we just joined 5,000. We don't know how many women, how many children. And so now you've got maybe 10% of the whole city is now turning away from their religion, their ideas of all that, and they're, they're joining this movement called the church. And so the religious leaders, they, they don't like this. They don't like this at all. And so they arrest Peter and John. I mean, all they did was tell the truth about what they had seen, that Jesus was the Son of God and rose again. And, go, and they throw him in the jail for the night. And word spreads out, and the disciples hear about it, and they're freaking out. And then the next day, the rulers, the religious leaders, they, they pull them out there, 
And they say, okay, what was all the commotion about? What is going on? And Peter's like, here's another opportunity to tell who Jesus is. So he tells them, you crucified him, but he resurrected. You crucified him, but he resurrected. And and, and here's how he concludes his sermon in verse 12 of Acts chapter 4. He says, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name, talking about Jesus, given under heaven by which we must be saved. I mean, take it down, Peter. Tone it down a little bit. You've been arrested for already saying this. How bold do you have to be? I mean, this is crazy. And he's saying, hey, I, I, I can't stop. I will not stop telling the truth. This will change your life. Jesus, the guy that you murdered, he rose. He lived. He lives. And he can't shut up. And, and, and so... Look at what happens in verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that he had been with Jesus, that they had been with Jesus. And they saw the man who was healed standing beside him. There's Johnny. What could they say? I mean, he's walking, he's healed. These people are watching. What what can we say? And so they say, okay, boys, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to let you go. But here's what you got to do. You got to stop with this stuff. You got to stop creating this commotion. You you need to not talk about resurrection. Don't talk about Jesus. Quit blaming us for crucifying him. Just keep your mouth shut. And basically, Peter looks right at him and says, boys, you got to do what you got to do, and so do I. We cannot stop talking about what we've seen. And so they let him go with the warning. And Peter and John, they go through the streets and they find their disciples. And now it's time to pray together. The disciples, they're like, oh my gosh, thank thank you. I'm glad you're here. So we got to pray. We got to pray. Now, let's pause the story. How would you respond if two of your leaders, two of your brothers, your friends come to you. They have been locked in prison for proclaiming Jesus, for testifying about who Jesus was and the resurrection. How would you respond? What are you going to pray for? I mean, for me, here's what I'm going to say. Guys, listen, first off, I'm glad you're here. But you've got to stay away from each other. And you've got to tone it down a lot. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get two tricked out black Escalades. And we're going to get four security guys with little head pieces, ear pieces, and packing. And wherever you go, we're going to make sure that you're protected. Well, listen, this talk about the resurrection and, and those people crucifying Jesus, just tone it down. I mean, let's teach what Jesus did. Let's talk about love. Let's teach them how to pray. Um, remember the Sermon on the Mount? We can do that. But, but don't talk about the resurrection. Don't tell them that they crucified him. That's what I'm saying. Watch how they pray. Watch how the church prays in Acts 4, beginning in verse 24. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In other words, God, before we ask anything of you, before we go asking for our needs to be met, we, we want to recognize that you are God, you are in control, and we want, you, we, we want to remind you that we know who you are and who we're praying for. Who the mouth, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, and now they're going to quote an Old Testament passage that predicted that the Messiah would be mistreated and persecuted. Verse 25, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then they they bring it to their context. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people 
of Israel. In other words, listen to me, if, if you're new to studying scripture, if, if you're new to this whole idea of Christianity, this wasn't written hundreds of years after the events of Jesus. This was written a couple months after the events in a city where it happened. And so they're praying and they're going, God, you're the greatest. You're the sovereign God. You predicted this kind of thing. You predicted that all of this would happen. And sure enough, right here in our midst, Herod and Pilate rose up against Jesus. In Acts 28, they affirmed that. They say to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. They believe that, that all of this stuff, this craziness of Jesus, their friend, being murdered, crucified, the resurrection, the promised Messiah, all of this was overseen by God. It was predestined. And then they get to the prayer. The part of the prayer, now, this is the part where we go, bless me this day, help me this day, protect me this day, keep me out of jail, God, you know, give us our, you know, all of this. Give me, give me, give me. This is what we would do. Here's what they do. And now, Lord, look upon their threats, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. Come out. Now, before we finish this prayer, I'm thinking, boldness? I mean, isn't, isn't boldness what got you in this mess in the first place? Isn't boldness why you were arrested? Isn't boldness what caused this chaos? Isn't, the, isn't boldness... It's created this spirit that, it, that the religious leaders and you, I mean, it, boldness is the problem. And, and, and let me just be honest, guys. Don't you think you're pretty bold? I mean, you're out there preaching, you got thrown in jail, and you're still preaching. I think you got boldness covered. That's probably not what we need to pray for. Let me ask you, as you hear this, have you ever prayed for boldness? I mean, do you remember the last time you prayed for boldness? I mean, boldness to speak God's word to people. Boldness to testify who he is. Boldness to your neighbors. Boldness, boldness to your co-workers. Boldness to people. I mean, sometimes we pray God help them become a Christian. I pray they get saved, but... You know, we're, I'm not going to say anything until after that happens. I mean, have you ever asked God to enable you and give you opportunities for boldness? Do you know why the message of Jesus got to the 21st century? It's because the first century Christians prayed for boldness. And that's just the first thing. Look at verse 30. They pray again. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Stretch out your hand, God. Perform signs and wonders through Jesus' names. Have you ever prayed that? Well, Chris, I don't go to that kind of church. I don't know about signs and wonders. Listen, this is what they're praying for. Let me tell you why this verse has been so misconstrued, why you, you have a problem when you hear signs and wonders. What are these people asking for? They're asking to go out into their community, in their marketplace, in their village, in their workplace, go out to a community that don't, doesn't believe and to live their lives in such a way that people who don't believe that were skeptical, had reasons to be skeptical, they would see something in them and go, whoa, what is that? I need to know what's happening. I need to be a part of that. I mean, let me ask you, you've seen miracles of God. You've prayed for miracles of God. Some of you have had radical miracles of God. Do you realize that the miracles of God were not only for the sake of the people that, that were affected by the miracles? It was for the sake of all people. Here's what I mean. Some of you have prayed and you've received a financial blessing from someone. And it's a miracle. It came at just the right time. Can I ask who did you tell about that? And who did you promote? Don't, don't just promote people. You promote the God who provided. Some of you have been healed. You better point back to the miracle 
maker, the, the, the one who, the way maker, right? The miracle worker, the one who, who has performed the miracle. We point it back to God. You get a good word today. You don't say, man, Pastor Chris gave a good word. You point it to God. You say, to God be the glory. You got to hear this. This is life changing, right? The miracles point to the man of Jesus, not to the miracle. That's what was happening in the first church. They were helping each other. They were serving each other. Miracles were being formed. The lame was walking. Why? So that people would come to Christ. 5,000 people came to Christ through the miracle, through the testifying. Can you imagine if we prayed like this? Make us bold and God stretch your hand out to perform signs and wonders. I'll tell you what will happen. You will see more opportunities because God made you this way. Hear me. God designed you to see exactly what you're looking for. That's, that's human nature. You see what you're looking for. And when you begin to pray, God, make me bolder. Give me opportunities. Give me signs and wonders. Heal our land. You'll see him. And here's how it ends. Listen to this. And when they had prayed this way, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Have you ever been filled with the Spirit? Come on, do you feel his power? I've been in those moments where I just know that God is in me and, and there's a miracle that's happening. And God, I pray for that for you. I pray for that for our city. I pray for that for our church, God. Check out what happened. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. Verse 34, there wasn't a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and bought, brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. That when they were bold, you see what happened? That they were filled with the Spirit by praying this prayer. That for this boldness, there was an outbreak of extreme generosity. Not because of a sermon, not, not from, from guilt or pressure. It's because as they became outsider focused, bold focused, focused on the hurting, the broken, the lost. As they became that way, they became more generous. It was about their community, so now they're helping the poor. They're pulling in and, and orphans and adopting, and they're helping the widows, and they're helping each other. This boldness produces this generosity. And so my question is, are you praying bold prayers? You say, Chris, how do I get this boldness? Number one, you trust God's purpose for his mission. Remember the beginning of their prayers? They said, sovereign God, all of this is in your control and your power. Some of you are going through a struggle right now. It is under the control of God. You may not see him, you may not feel him, but you don't trust the feeling, you trust your faith. And you walk by faith, not by sight. Something bad happens, you use it to further God's mission. I think of Chance Walters who spoke, a former drug addict, now ministering and seeing people freed from addiction. If God gives you something good, you use it to further God's kingdom. I think of a couple in our church who, who gave their money Trump sent money to families to help, and they, they gave a large portion of that to reaching people. That's what we do. We trust that God is in control. And number two, you want boldness? Get in the word so the word gets in to you. I say it all the time. That needs to be etched inside of you. Remember what they prayed? They went back to the Old Testament scripture. When you are in a battle, when you are in a dark place, when you are low, when the world looks chaotic around you, you know what you need to do? You don't need to fight by, by going and gossiping. You don't need to be fight by seeking counselors. You need to get in the word so you can fight back with the word. I like to say it this way. Know the scripture so well that when life cuts you, you bleed God's word. Number three, be motivated by Jesus. Be motivated by Jesus. Jesus, 
Jesus risked his life. He, he, he gave his life so that we could be saved, all of us. What more motivation do you need? You were dead. I was dead. And now we are alive. Some of us need to start living like we have life. <laughs> how dare us not share the gospel because we're afraid of how it'll make us look or we're afraid of rejection or we're afraid. How much must we hate someone not to tell them who Jesus is? Your motivation to be bold comes from Jesus. Number four, have a generous spirit. We, we just talked about it. Their boldness and witness was an extension of their generosity of life. Are you holding on to things with closed fists? You need to open them up. You need to open them up. Because the message is that important. We've got to be generous with our time, with our talents, with the gospel. Be generous. And finally, seek a repeated filling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit one time, one time, but you are filled with him repeatedly. You need to pray for that filling be led by the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want to do. Right where you are, I want you to stand. Come on. I know. Stand up. Come on. Stand. And what I want to do is I want to pray a prayer. It's the prayer that was written in scriptures. And I want you to repeat it after me because this needs to be the prayer of our church. So let's pray. Go ahead and lift your hand and surrender to God. Father, enable me to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders. Through the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Super powerful message today. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for delivering yet another banger, as the kids would say. Um, it's all about being bold, right? Like, just be bold. Be bold. I think that's one thing that um, that is needed. You know, I mean, a lot of people have been home for a couple months. They haven't been out and about. Um, be bold. And and let's not let's not like let's not take it out of context, right? Being bold isn't, isn't being reckless. Um, it's not, you know, just being cray. It's not being crazy. Um, just be bold. Be bold with, 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 with who you are, with God. Be bold in, uh, in how you are living and how you are um, discipling to people. And, uh, and I, think it, it'll, I think it's such a good message. It's so good. So um, if you were moved to take your next steps, we have our next steps card. You can find the link in the, in the uh, comments section below. You can also go to our app and you can, uh, you can take your next steps there. But, but by all means, I mean, the first thing is, is you have to take those next steps. And, and it's so simple. It's just raising your hand and, and putting your putting your, your hat in the ring, so to speak, saying, I'm going to take my next steps. We'll help you figure out what they are. Or maybe you already know what they are. Maybe you'd like to be baptized. I know we've got a, a bit of a waiting list, um, and we're looking forward to being able to, to roll through some baptisms as soon as we're back in the building. We saw one last week, and that was awesome. And, uh, and I think there's plenty more of that to come. Um, so maybe your next step is to... Uh, is to to get baptized maybe it is to join the church or join a life group maybe it's just to uh, to get involved with the church family uh, of vision uh, maybe it's to just start giving on a weekly basis and a consistent basis um, you know maybe it's it's you know you be bold maybe go out and buy your first bible or you know what if you don't have one we can find one for you we will supply it uh, just be bold be bold in, in your next steps and don't be afraid don't be afraid i I've said it before, I'll say it again. Um, I didn't think that I would ever be, you know, hosting uh, our online service for church, 
those that that have seen me and and uh, and know me know that normally I'm the I'm the guy in the back. I sit in the back at church, and uh, I do that so I can see. It's easier for me to see. Um, but I was the guy in the back, and and now I'm now I'm here in front of this camera, and and it seems really weird to me, but. Point being is just take your next steps. You don't know where it will lead and uh, and how fulfilling it will be. Um, so, so be sure and, and do that and, and be bold with it. Be bold. Don't, don't just like put your toes in the water. Just jump in. Just jump in. It'll be fine. We're here for you. We're here for you. So um, before we get out of here today, we've always got our seats to the streets. And we got a good one. So three parts. We've got a laugh section, we've got a learn section, we've got a love section. So for our laugh section today, it is photo op. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a photo of you doing something you normally wouldn't do. It could be something in the past, it could be something that you plan to do, something that you're currently doing, but something that you don't normally do. And, uh, and it's gotta be bold, it's gotta be courageous, right? And I want you to share that we want you to put a hashtag, be bold, all right? Hashtag be bold. Um, so photo op, something that you wouldn't normally do, bold and courageous, hashtag be bold. Got it? All right, cool. So for our learn, we are gonna memorize Acts 4, 29 to 30. Acts 4, 29 to 30, all right? So that's for our learn section. And then for love, we've got pray boldly. We're gonna pray boldly this week. So what we're gonna do, it's real simple, all right? Is we're gonna, we're gonna pray that God gives you an opportunity with someone that you know needs Jesus. I think we all know somebody that needs Jesus, right? And you can close your eyes, you can think about that for a second, maybe jot it down on your notes there. But I want you to pray for someone specifically that you know needs Jesus. And then you're gonna pray that God gives you an opportunity with this person to share Jesus, all right? And then what you're going to do is when that opportunity comes, you're going you're gonna to take it and you're going to actually talk to this person about Jesus. You're going to have that conversation. It could be uncomfortable. It probably will be. But you know what? You just got to follow, follow your godly instincts. You got to follow your heart and, uh, and be bold. So like I always say, let's go out and be the church this week. But let's go out and be the bold church this week. Let's be the church that loves unconditionally. Let's love Jesus. Let's love one another. Let's love people. And uh, let's live our purpose. Let's live our godly purpose. And uh, make it a great week. Can't wait to see you guys next week. And of course, if you need anything, you guys know where to find me. Have a good week, guys.